give for the Lord Jesus a wonderful round of applause. I'm going to tell you about something sad that happened while God was preparing mankind and and so he called Abraham and then he called Isaac and then he called Jacob. Jacob had 12 children and we're familiar with his story and one of them was very spiritual, Joseph, the one that the Lord was using. And Joseph he went to Egypt, suffered a lot, but remained faithful. He passed all of his trials. And Joseph had two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. God ordered the division of Joseph's inheritance. There were 12 tribes by two. But Ephraim, who had such a blessed father and an example of a good person, he did things that he shouldn't have done. And that was a stab in the heart of God. Let's go to the book of Psalms. Let this be a lesson for all of us, brethren. Psalm 78, the verse is number 9. It tells us about God having prepared the children of Ephraim to take possession of the blessing, but they didn't. Let's read what it says. Psalm 78, verse number 9. The children of Ephraim, being armed and carrying bows, turned back in the day of battle. This attitude does not please God. The letter in Hebrews 10:38 it says the following, Now the just, now the just shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But Dr. Suarez, what am I supposed to do? I don't have the necessary strength or the courage to fight against the enemy. What you are lacking is consecration. While everything is fine, continue to seek God but not the way you've been doing it. Seek him with more enthusiasm, with determination. Ask the Lord, God, I want to have a real encounter with you because one of these days, as the rain pours down on everyone, so do problems and afflictions. And sometimes, brethren, the devil really tries to destroy us, but he won't succeed as long as we are prepared. But even though we are prepared, if you feel that you are prepared, Pay close attention to what the Lord says to you because once the battle begins, you must never draw back. Start by getting the bows that God has given you and arm yourself and get ready for battle. Remember the verses, the instructions that God has given you, and when the battle begins, start shooting. You never know how many, uh, how many arrows you have, but you will never run out of arrows before the enemy is defeated. It was time to fight the battle. Ephraim was armed. Ephraim was carrying bows. But instead of starting to use them, he looked at his enemy, thought he didn't have the power to overcome them, so he, they, they turned back. They retreated. They took a step back. And then what happened? God became displeased with the children of Ephraim. So God was upset. He was angry. And he, he was also frustrated. And this is not good for us. You can rest assured when you fight the battle with the weapons of righteousness which God has made known to you, you are sending the Lord ahead of you. He will open up the way. He will destroy all plans laid down by the enemy and he will make you completely victorious. Ephraim, in the day of the battle, it is written here, it's very sad, the children of Ephraim being armed, God didn't let them into the battle unarmed, neither does he let us, and carrying bows. They were fully prepared for the battle turned back in the day of battle. But why did they retreat? They did not keep the covenant of God. They refused to walk in his law. We have to keep the covenant that the Lord made with us. The covenant is a pact made through the blood of Jesus. Under this covenant, we have nothing at all to do with the power of the devil. We have been delivered and we have the power to cast out demons and to heal the sick. We have the power to enter into the presence of God and we have the power to demand more power if that is necessary. But we cannot by any means fail to keep, to keep the covenant of God. They did not keep the covenant of God. They refused to walk in his law. Oh, well, I will walk in God's law, but everyone else is doing it. I strongly advise you not to do it because if you do, you will surely trip and fall. They did not keep the covenant of God and refused to walk in his law. And then what happened to them next in verse 11? And forgot his works and his wonders that he had shown them. My brethren, 
don't forget about God's works that have already occurred in your life, which are not that all could have done for you, but only a sample of all the great things that he wants to do in your life. They forgot the works that God had shown them, and they refused to walk in God's law. No, I will give, I will keep his law. Ephraim, why did you do that? Why did you forget the works of God and all the wonders that he had shown you? That which God has shown you through faith, hold on to it. Maybe it won't, maybe it won't happen today or tomorrow. It wasn't meant for now. But the day will come when God will say, now is the time. A miracle will take place in the name of Jesus. Everything that Joshua saw Moses do, God's great works, they remained in Joshua's heart. When he had to save the men of Gibeon, because the kings of the Amorites had declared war against them, and the battle was being waged, he started to, to chase their enemies, and the Lord God helped him out. The Lord God sent down large hailstones from heaven on them, and then Joshua felt, now is the time, so he shouted, sun stand still over Gibeon and moon in the valley of Ajalon. And for about a whole day, the, the sun, uh, it, stood, it, it stood still. The day was stretched out. Someone calculated that 23 hours and 20 minutes was the extra time because of one man's prayer. But did God speak to Joshua? I don't know. But he saw Moses being used by God. And when he saw that, he felt that one day the Lord would use him too. If you, through the word of God, let's say by reading it or meditating, you feel that God will do something great, hold on to it. Your day will come. Perhaps it'll be the last thing in your life. I don't know. But that moment you feel, and God spoke to God. Lord, now is the time. And Jesus said, didn't I tell you that if you believed you would see God's glory? Believe and you'll see your brother raised. But Lord, he's been dead for four days. His body already smells. How is that possible? Leave it to me. Do your part and I will do the miracle. <laughs> and Jesus made Lazarus raised from the dead. The children of Ephraim forgot God's work. Look how sad, brethren. How often it is that we forget God's works that he has done in our life and has shown us. We forget about God's works and look at that which is visible to the enemy's threat, thinking that this time he will defeat us. Forgot God's wonders that he had shown them. God had shown them his wonders. But before the battle, they turned back. Brethren, do not turn back. Keep walking. I will. God has already shown me his works. God has shown me his wonders. I will make it there in the name of the Lord Jesus. Let's read the three verses one more time. The children of Ephraim, being armed and carrying bows, turn back in the day of battle. When the Lord tells you, today is the day of your battle, Lord, thank you. You go ahead of me fighting for me. You will overcome my enemy. They did not keep the covenant of God. They refused to walk in his law. Don't do that. Keep God's covenant and do not refuse to walk in God's law. God's law is different from our laws. Man's law is political. It changes in accordance with the situation, and it really changes. To win an election, a politician will make a pact with the devil. He really doesn't care. We are different. We only make a pact with the truth. So let's walk in God's law. Let's not, by any means, compromise ourselves. The children of Ephraim compromised themselves. No, there's no way. But where are bows and arrows? It's impossible. They refused to walk in God's laws, but God's law is the law of victory. In God's law, there is no defeat. And forgot his works. Never forget of that which God has made you understand about what he wants to do in your life and his wonders that he had shown them. That which hasn't yet happened, but which you felt. That's a reason to pray. And now to wrap it up, verse 12. Marvelous things he did in the sight of their fathers in the land of Egypt in the field of Zoan. Everything he did before our wonders and he wants to do in our lives. He did in the sight of our fathers in faith and he wants to do in our lives in the same faith. Let us pray now. Dear Father, it is so beautiful to walk with you. God, we feel enthusiastic. We become excited to see your spirit working in our midst. Lord, the marvelous things you did in the past will take place again. You will do wonders in our lives, but God, they must happen within us. And we bow down now before you, Father. 
We are one single family. We are fighting the same battle. My brother's success interests me, and my success interests my brother. Together, Lord, we will never change because you are with us. Victory is yours, and we will show the devil that walking with you, God, is well worth it. Bring victory to these people who are praying with me, God. They trust in your word. They honor you. They are crying out to you. They are your servants, and they want to do your will. In the name of Jesus, we now pray. Thank you, God. Amen. Amen, brethren. And now let's go to the real-life drama for today. In the name of Christ. It's been five years since I started attending church. It was my daughter who brought me. I learned about the Grace of God ministry through the television. God spoke to me a lot through Dr. Suarez, and I felt the desire to get to know the Grace of God Church. I liked the ministry a lot, and then I introduced it to my mother, who fell in love with it. When I started to get to know Jesus, to get involved in church, my daughter strayed. I started to seek God, to seek God and to plead with Him, but my daughter didn't want anything to do with Jesus. Sometimes she would even get mad at me. She was, she was rude to me. I went back to ground zero. I would go to parties, seeking entertainment. I started drinking too much every day. I would hang out with people who People who only encouraged me to remain on that same behavior, drinking. And my life became really sad without any meaning. At that, at that point, I was 19. My daughter had brought me to Jesus, and then she strayed. Wasn't I going to bring her back to God's path? I couldn't accept that, you know. She would bring me the church newsletter on Sundays when she went to church with the testimonies given by people who went to church. But then I felt the desire to become a sponsor. One day I was sitting, I was sitting on the couch and I was watching Dr. Swati's program. I was crying and I asked God to speak to me and Dr. Swati said, why are you crying, sister? And then he, he said, God is calling you, sister. You're not aware of it, but God is speaking to you right now. He is talking to me. The next day I went to church and filled out a form to become a sponsor of the Faith Show. I became a sponsor and God started to open doors for me. I believe what made the difference was her perseverance. She had, she also received support from the pastors of the Grace of God Church until I finally started to change my behavior. She stopped hanging out with those people. She, she even brought some of her co-workers to Jesus. Today she's a real blessing. From the moment I took one step towards the Lord, He took many steps towards me. My life really changed. I was blessed in my professional life. I received a promotion for which I work. I met, I met, I had the opportunity to meet my current husband. God brought a precious man into my daughter's life. They became engaged and soon they got married. We got married and we lived in, in a house which, which was very cramped and God put in my heart that He was going to take me to a better place. The day we got married, we received the news that our application for mortgage was approved. Was approved and in my birthday the Lord presented us with the apartment keys. Everything that we have, all things we have that I got and that my daughter got was given us by the Lord God. It all started when I turned to God and the Lord turned to me as well. God is, He is beautiful. God is truly awesome. God is my foundation. The Lord is my structure. Without God, I'm nothing. And today, I, I have this conviction. And I managed to bring my daughter back to Jesus. Glory to God, how beautiful. We can all learn from this, brethren, that there is always a battle being waged for every person. No one enters into the kingdom of God without a battle. 
The devil was destroying her. In this case, the devil was converted. She brought her mother to Jesus. Her mother was converted. And then she lost her fiancé and strayed from God's path. That's exactly what the devil wanted. But her mom said, I will plead with God. The mother was like Ephraim, who was armed with bows and arrows. You are an Ephraim of God. But do not turn back, brethren. She acted differently from Ephraim. She didn't turn back. We are not people who ever turn back. We are people who persevere until victory. It's like her daughter said, her mother had perseverance. She brought her daughter back to Jesus. How much would it cost for all eternity, the suffering of her soul? It would be eternal. But the Lord delivered her completely. Now she has eternal glory. You have a person in your family who needs to be brought to Jesus. Your mission is not to become rich. Your mission is not to become the wisest. You have no other mission. Your only mission is to bring your family to Jesus and all other things will be added to you. Who said this was Jesus in Matthew 6.33. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. God's work comes in first place. Don't put a person in first place. I've heard many preachers over the years say that, especially from the Western world. It goes like this, they start first, with him, then his family, then God's works. No, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, God's work, and all these things shall be added to you. They change the order, then lose their families, and they lose everything. Those who are changing the order is missing out. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's God's work. And all these things shall be added to you. Then you can set your scale of values. Ask God's guidance because he is wise. He is good in showing us our priorities. And now let's go to the question and answer segment. Is it wrong to have friends of other religions? No, however, it depends on whom you call friends. Because if the person does not belong to Jesus, let's say, in very simple language, this person cannot really help us in anything. And friends must help each other. Because when we, when we see a friend undergoing a trial, we have to seek guidance from Lord to encourage our friend. And sometimes it is hard work. The person falls into a bottomless pit. And sometimes for months and months, you have to speak the word and be persistent until the person finally gets out of the pit. But how can someone help you without knowing anything about God? Well, we have a friend that's closer to us than a brother. It's the Lord Jesus. When he gives us guidance, and we will have all of these people as our friends and people whom we will help, people whom we will bring to Christ, and the Lord will give us a word that will speak into these people's lives. How can I become a friend of Jesus? You have to do his will. He said, you are my friends, if you do whatever I command you. He is a friend of everyone, but not always are we his friend because we don't do what he commands us. What has Jesus told us to do for our friends? Bring them to Jesus. There's nothing better. Now let's turn to Mark chapter 1 and verse number 27. These days I've been talking about things that have amazed us in God's work. And here Mark says the following. Mark 1 chapter 21 verse 1. Let's start with verse 21. Then they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and taught. Jesus was never, ever tired, brethren. He was never tired to go to the synagogue on Saturdays, as was the tradition. Some people don't go to church every Sunday. They only come when there is the Lord's Supper, and that's wrong. Oh, but God doesn't do marvelous things in my life. That's because you're not prepared. Come, and God will prepare you. They went into Capernaum, and on the Sabbath, Jesus entered the synagogue, and there he taught. Whenever you come to the house of God, come with completely open mind, because Jesus will teach you. We preachers, many times, without even knowing why, we plan to speak about one thing, but we're led to speak about something else. Sometimes, that which we end up saying is exactly what many people needed to hear, and souls are saved. So you will grow and straighten up. So people were there to hear Jesus' teachings, and what happened? And they were astonished at his teaching. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Jesus' teaching has nothing to do with religion. This thing about religion is very narrow-minded. It's kind of bigoted. It's something that almost has a trick behind it, if it doesn't, to be able to catch you. But Jesus' teaching is different. 
You are not caught by his teaching. You are simply delivered from anything that enslaves you and you start getting to know God better. When something bad happens in a person's life, it's never by chance. It's part of a scheme from the devil which was plotted in hell and was successful. And it will continue until the day the person hears the word of God. The day when you hear the word of God, you will never be the same person again. You can even remain an unbeliever and go straight to hell because you want. Because if you know the truth, the Lord will give you the power to get rid of the devil. It's the best present that God can give any one of us. Let's say you go to a city where there's no one who serves the Lord, a nation where people don't belong to God, and you sow the seed of God's message. You have done the best work ever. Some people will receive Jesus immediately. Others will take some time, but everyone there will receive God's blessing. And they were astonished because Jesus taught them with authority, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. And let's read what happens next. Now there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, People with an unclean spirit are sometimes even in the church and sometimes in our own homes. How many households, how many families have become divided because someone with an unclean spirit abused a family member, did something they shouldn't have done, and now the person has simply lost the will to live treating others like animals, and sometimes doesn't even care about others. This is the work of the devil, brethren. Can it be fixed? Yes, Jesus can fix this. Dr. Suarez, I have been a victim of some abuse. Now you have to serve the Lord and show his love. God will undo any evil works, and you will become a successful person in the name of the Lord Jesus. So this man with an unclean spirit described here in this passage could only do things that were filthy. And he shouted. People like this are the first to cry out, Oh, what is this thing about Jesus? The gospel is a big lie. We have our own religion. Is that working for you? No, these people are frustrated. Have you had an encounter with God? We think we have. Well, the true God who will strengthen you, the one who will make you victorious, or you prefer to continue in your old religious ways. And the unclean spirit cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. We don't have a lot of time today, but this unclean spirit was the devil's advocate. He raised three questions trying to confuse Jesus. The devil will do that. He is always trying to make people doubt the Holy Word of God. The unclean spirit knew that Jesus was the Son of God, that one day Jesus would destroy them, but now was not the time. So he asked, did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus didn't want to speak with the evil spirit. Jesus was interested in blessing the people. And what did Jesus say? Jesus rebuked him saying, be quiet and come out of him. This is the authority that we must have, brethren. And the very moment that we are enlightened by Jesus, we receive this, this, this wonderful blessing. The devil has to shut up and leave our lives, of all of our thoughts, leave our practices, leave our uncertainties. He who is holding us back and preventing us from becoming successful in life, all you have to do is stay firm. Brethren, this holy word contains such a fierce fire that no evil spirit will resist. It won't be able to continue to bind you, frustrating your plans, making you remain a slave of the devil. If until today you have obeyed an evil spirit, today you must take a position. I will change. I won't accept this because this word has entered into your heart. All evil must leave now, must shut up, paralyze all his works and come out. And when the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him. It doesn't matter if it is convulsing or crying out. It will come out of your life or the life of whoever is being oppressed. What happened next? Then they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. In many places this teaching has gotten old. Jesus no longer casts out evil spirits, 
Now a crazy person, poor him, he has a mental condition. Uh, an abuser, oh poor thing, he's unable to control himself. Dear brethren, any person who is demon possessed has a mental problem, spiritual problem, physical problem, financial problem, or unable to deal with others. Any person who is freed from an evil spirit is delivered from all these things. So the solution is to go back to the true teaching, the new teaching that Jesus brought us and that was able to set free the oppressed. It is with authority that we can do that. What new doctrine is this? For with authority, not with polite or weak words, he commands, commands, not asks or bargains with unclean spirits, and they will obey because together with an order given in the name of the Lord Jesus comes the fire of God burning, and all the evil spirit wants to do is disappear, leave immediately to never ever come back. If the devil is tempting you and you are about to give in and you are about to fall into temptation from the devil and that means that you are lacking this authority, this power, this strength which the Lord wants to give you in the name of Jesus. And what does the last verse say? And immediately his fame spread throughout all the region around Galilee. Our fame will spread throughout everywhere, either as a sinner or as a failure. But if it has to spread, let it be as a victorious people, people of God. And the Lord wants to do that in your life. The Lord wants you to have good fame among creditors, among your family members, among even those people with which you fell. This person has changed. I have changed. Now I have dignity. Jesus came to bring us life, abundant life. No one will have abundance in their lives if they are being humiliated, considered as the other one, as merely an object. God wants to make of you a real blessing. Let us pray now. God, thank you so much because today you have opened our understanding. You have showed us that your new teaching cannot become old. On the contrary, the new teaching has to be, it, it just simply has to uh, be preached. It has to take up every single corner of our inner being, of our daily lives. We are a territory as vast as the planet Earth. And there cannot be anything in us that doesn't glorify your name. Lord, where there is a disease, an infirmity, a sinner, there is the hand of the devil. But now I will demand it to leave. I unite my faith with yours and I say to all evil spirits, get out of this person's life in the name of Jesus. And you say, thank you, Jesus.